were thinking about semiconducting and metallic organic polymers. And of course, organic polymers uh, are made up of carbon. And carbon, as you know, has uh, its 1s shell filled. It has its 2s shell filled, 2s squared, and it has two electrons in the uh, in the p or p shell. We also know that carbon can form two principal structures. Uh, forms diamond, where you have tetra tetrahedral covalent bonds, and it forms graphite, where you have the uh, hexagonal covalent bonds. Uh, and out of, out of this kind of a structure, we will see uh, insulating polymers. And out of this kind of a structure, we will see conjugated polymers or semiconducting polymers. This is the ground state configuration of the carbon atom in free space. But of course, if you put the carbon atom in an environment where there are other atoms, uh, the total energy is lowered if you change that configuration. This is, the, the, of course, the famous chemical bond. So what we're going to do is we're going to promote one electron from the filled 2s up into the 2p. So the configuration would be 1s squared 2s 2p3. And this costs energy, right? Because this orbital is higher energy uh, than the s orbital. Costs about 6 electron volts. However, you gain that energy back, clearly, and more by, by forming the, uh, the, the covalent bond. So we take linear combinations of these, of this s, I've got an unfilled s electron, I've got three uh, p orbitals, I form lin linear combinations uh, with either sp3 tetrahedral symmetry or sp2pz uh, hexagonal plus a pi bond. This one will give us diamond structure or will give us polyethylene. This one will give us uh, graphite structure or will give us polyacetylene. And we can just follow those routes uh, to a variety of polymers. Just for, uh, for completeness, I mean, if you can look this up in many places, but uh, in Pauling's book, for example, uh, you can find the correct linear uh, linear combinations for sp3 hybridization using the s, px, py, and pz orbitals. Uh, if, you, if you work that out, you know, this is the form that will give you the, the tetrahedral uh, directed orbitals of, uh, to form a diamond-like structure or, for example, to, to, to form the structure of, of polyethylene. In the case of hexagonal symmetry, a little bit more complicated, as you, as you can see. Uh, here you take these same orbitals, uh, you put them in, as we call the sp, sp2 uh, hybridization. Uh, this is the pi bond, a pi electron, uh, whose orbitals stick out from the plane. And these are the, uh, the three directed orbitals at uh, zero angle, 120, 240, 360, give you the hexagonal symmetry. Here's the picture for this one. The PZ orbital is sticking, is, is coming out of the plane like this. But, this, but the simplest, uh, in, 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 said, said very simply, the discovery of conducting polymers was the realization that, that this structure could, is basically like, gives an electronic structure like that of a semiconductor. So that's what we're going to pursue, and, and we're going to, uh, to look at how those, those pi electron polymers uh, have evolved over, over many years, okay? And this is the basic sort of outline of the, of the uh, information we're going to be talking about. Uh, I'll give you some introdu introduction, obviously. We'll be talking about doping of these polymers. We'll be talking about the fact that they are rather special materials, uh, not typical of, uh, of conventional semiconductors. We'll be talking about some of the basic, uh, basic physics of these uh, materials, 
uh, the metal physics, and then we'll get into a variety of, of, of applications. So this is what I was saying before. Carbon now has four valence electrons. In this particular case where I'm talking about polyethylene, we're going to use the sp3 configuration for the carbon atom. And why do we do that is because we know from, from the structure that, that that's the right answer. Uh, this gives you a diamond-like structure for the, uh, for, for the carbons here. And of course, this carbon is, is bonded to this one, to this one, to one hydrogen, another hydrogen. So all four of those electrons are tied up in chemical bonds. This is the classic, this is the classic uh, uh, organic polymer. One can make much more complexity. One can change this, change this. And from, from such side chains, one can get a variety of properties. Or we know about them. They're, they're flexible. They're transparent. They're in, insulating. And they have a remarkable range of, uh, of properties. Uh, they can be made into fabrics, fibers, uh, engineering plastics. Uh, they can be very strong. This structure here, if you get a high degree of, of, of structural order, high degree of chain extension, and tra chain orientation uh, by, for example, uh, doing uh, gel processing of polyethylene, one can get a very high degree of structural order. And under those circumstances, the strength is uh, approaching that of, of a carbon-carbon bond, which, which, of course, is diamond. So these are very strong materials. Now, of course, these materials are, are, are important. Uh, these uh, saturated polymers are used in higher quantities than any other material. It's a remarkable statement. More by volume and more by weight, even though they're very low density materials. Incredibly important in our, in our society. But they are not useful as electronic materials, I mean, perhaps as insulators, but not as electronic materials. There's no, there's no uh, utility here for for moving electrons around, uh, for making electronic materials. By the way, I think we understand this. This word saturated means that the four outer electrons of the carbon atom are all involved in a covalent bond. And you see, polyacetylene starts out with this basic hexagonal structure, this is 120 degrees here. And these are the, let's take this carbon atom. So there's a directed orbital here. There's a directed orbital here. There's a directed orbital here. That's, of course, these three, these three orbitals. There's this one, this one, and this one. And the PZ electron is the, is the fourth electron, which uh, I'm showing here schematically as, as this one. You understand, if this is the plane, this, this this is a planar structure, and with respect to that plane, the PZ wave function, you know, is anti-symmetric about the plane. This is, a, of course, a real material. I have a, a sample, and maybe, maybe you've never seen polyacetylene. Okay, so this is a sample of polyacetylene that was probably made 25 years ago, and it's, it, it is a not a very stable material, as you know. But if you keep it in a in vacuum, and this is of course sealed in glass, then it will last forever. Uh, and I'll pass it around. Nice shiny material on one side. Uh, on the other side, a little bit dull. But if you if you polish that, it would it would look the same on both sides. Now you see, in the case of polyacetylene, these three electrons, these three. These three orbitals here, which are forming the sp3 hybridization, set up the backbone of the chain. Okay? This carbon is bonded to this carbon, to this carbon, and to this hydrogen. And the carbon orbitals that are involved are these three orbitals. The fourth electron, the pi electron, uh, is, is, is shown schematically here. Now, in this case, the, the valence is not saturated. In this case, this pi electron could be here, or it could be here, or it could be here, it could be anywhere. 
And if you take that argument, you would say, well, it should delocalize and, and it should be a metal. And interestingly enough, if you look at the, if you look at the uh, sample of polyacetylene, it kind of looks a little shiny and metal-like. There's a lot of oscillator strength in, in, in the visible. Now, it's not a metal. It's a semiconductor. There, there are two things, that, two concepts that we should, we should think about at this point. If all these bond lengths are equal, then the question of whether this is a metal or an insulator is a, is a very interesting and important question. In the, in the 1970s, uh, Neville Mott in particular and, and others were interested in, in the metal, inter, metal to insulator transition. And the basic, uh, the basic question that they were asking is, do you gain more energy by allowing these electrons to delocalize along the chain, or are the electron-electron interaction so strong that it's, that it's energetically favorable for these electrons to sit down one localized, one on every carbon? Now, if that were the case, then this structure would be a magnetic insulator, something like the copper oxide uh, superconductors. But very quickly, if you start to, uh, to do experiments, uh, you conclude that's not the case. If uh, assuming, assuming that the electron-electron interactions are not so strong, and we'll come back and talk about uh, quanti quantification of that. Then there's, of course, another possibility, which is that these pi electrons might want to form a weak pi bond. This one, this pair, this pair. And that's what's being shown here. And what that means is, if there's a weak pi bond, then that means that this bond length will be shorter than this one. And you get a bond alternated structure. And indeed, that's what one finds if one studies polyacetylene. We do uh, either NMR studies uh, to get at the bond length or uh, structural to x-ray studies. One finds that, these, that this is a slightly shorter bond, slightly longer bond. That is to say, the bond order is higher here because you formed a weak pi bond. In this, uh, between, these, between these two pi electrons. As a result of, of the fact that this bond length is shorter and this is longer, shorter and longer, broken that symmetry, uh, polyacetylene is a semiconductor. The unit cell, the unit cell is, is, is this, right? And here's what I just said. If you look at this from the point of view of the chemical synthesis, the polymerization, here is the repeat unit uh, in acetylene, C2H2, these two electrons form a third uh, bond here. You open that bond, you, polymer you polymerize, and here is the acetylene repeat unit. It turns out, uh, if you just look at, look at the possibilities, um, one can put, one can take this, this structure and put it together uh, into a polymer in either uh, the cis polyacetylene form or the trans form. Okay? And it turns out that the, by using the catalysts that were, and I think still are used, the Ziegler Natta catalysts, you actually uh, synthesize polyacetylene uh, in this cis form, but it is not the thermodynamically stable state. The, the trans form has a lower energy than the cis form, and this, this sample that I passed around is a sample of trans polyacetylene. Uh, one can convert the cis form into the trans at room temperature if you just let it sit for a long time, or if you take the, uh, if you take the sample and you elevate it uh, to in excess of 100 degrees C, it'll rather quickly convert to this thermodynamically stable form. And you can think about how that happens, right? You just have to rotate 
around around these single bonds, and you can you can get it into that form. Uh, barrier for for that transformation is is not very high. You know, I said that we're going to take th this electron and this one and form a, a, a pi bond, this one and this one and form a pi bond. But I could have done it the other way. I could have taken this one and this one, this one and this one, and then the double bond would be here and the double bond would be here. So there's a, there is a degeneracy in the, uh, in the structure of trans polyacetylene because I can have a structure where I have single double, single double, single double, single double, or double single, double single. Okay. Now, in the if I had two such samples, you could not tell the difference. They're completely identical. But the I'll come back to talking about this because, of course, this degeneracy of the ground state is the source of the uh, soliton in polyacetylene and if we understand that, it leads us uh, into self-localization and the concept of polarons in this class of materials in, in, a, in a larger context. Well, okay, we know that uh, in some general sense, as I said earlier, the uh, directed covalent bonds form bonding and antibonding uh, orbitals, which hold this polymer together, okay? This is the, this is the uh, sigma band uh, in the jargon. This is the sigma star band, the antibonding band. Uh, this splitting is, is something of order 10 electron volts. That's what holds this structure together. These are very strong bonds. These are the carbon-carbon bonds, which go back to uh, the strength of diamonds. So this is a very uh, strong covalent bond. And then we have the pi electrons. And depending on the details, you know, the pi electrons form a, a band because I'm going to take a linear combination of, of PC orbitals from each repeat unit. And to zeroth approximation, I have the sigma and the sigma star and the pi bands in between. Uh, there may be some overlap, but the point I wanted to make here is that imagine that, that there's a, an energy gap here, for example, as there is in, in polyacetyl polyacetylene or PPV or any of these materials. If you make photo excitations within this structure, the material itself is stable. Why is that? That's because photo excitations in this structure do not break up the fundamental sigma bonds that are holding the, holding the polymer together. If you just have a, for example, if you have a, uh, a polyethylene-like structure, make it out of whatever you want, you can make silicones, where you, where you photo excite from the sigma to the sigma star band, this hole is, makes it a photoresist. It comes apart. Polyacetylene, polythiophene, the materials that we deal with are not photoresist because the photo excitations that we deal with every day and that we'll talk about a lot in this course are all within the pi system, not involving promotion of electrons from sigma to sigma star. It's an important point. Now, the details of the pi electron band structure depend on how many, uh, how many electrons there are in the unit cell. And here again, if all the bond links were equal and there were no, uh, and, 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 and uh, there were no pyros in stability, polyacetylene would be a metal. The electronic structure would, would look like this, uh, that is to say, uh, the electrons would be fully delocalized in this schematic picture. The, uh, the electronic structure in a simple tight binding like uh, picture would be that of a metal. Uh, this would be the pi band here. The Fermi level would be halfway up. 
the repeat unit would be one CH unit, okay? And this bandwidth would come about from pi electron overlap between along this chain. Because of the Pyrrhal's instability in a one-dimensional system, there's a fundamental reason why you get this bond alternation. Let's look at these two pictures. These pictures are supposedly identical. Here you have electron occupied all the way up to this energy, halfway up the, the band. If you put a small energy gap in at the Fermi energy, then you suppress the occupation right here. You only occupy down here. You create extra states at the edge of the band. That lowers the energy. And when you sum up those two contributions, the increase from the distortion of the, uh, of the bond lengths and the decrease from the electronic structure, you, in one dimension, it's always true that the distorted structure will have a lower energy. This is, this is the, uh, the, the famous Pyrrhal's instability. So in polyacetylene, the Pyrrhal's instability causes a metal to semiconductor transition. Okay? In principle, in principle, if you were to take the sample that, that I passed around and increase the temperature to a sufficiently high temperature, one would find a phase transition where you would move over into this metallic phase. Characteristic energy uh, for that transition is, is the band gap, and I, I will show you that the energy gap here is about 1.4, 1, 1 1.5 electron volts. The material would long uh, have burned up before one got to that temperature. Now the question that we need to look at next really is how wide are these, are these bands? Okay. And the fundamental question has to do with I have a pi electron here, I have a pi electron here, okay? The pi electron here is attracted to the nucleus over here, and the pi electron here is attracted to the nucleus on, over here, and so there is a transfer integral, okay? That transfer integral in molecular orbital theory is often called beta. In condensed matter theory, typically we use the uh, symbol T, that transfer integral determines the bandwidth. And as I'll show you, uh, the bandwidth here is, is, is of order 12 electron volts. It's like that of copper. So these are not um, delicate, uh, narrow band structures. These, are, these, these conjugated polymers are broad band robust structures with a robust electronic structure and a story that I will come back to many times, if indeed we could get high degrees of structural order, that should lead to semiconductors which have high mobility. The point I was making here is that because of this broad band structure, uh, in principle, one should be able to get relatively high mobilities. But as we will see uh, in the materials that are available to date, uh, the uh, the, the disorder is, is too large, we don't achieve those intrinsic uh, uh, mobilities. The transfer integral to, to, to carry an electron from one, si uh, from one side to the next, the attraction of that electron to, to the nucleus on the next side is, uh, we call it T0. Okay? And, we, and we explicitly note that there's a minus sign here because the electron is attracted to the nucleus on the next site, so that energy is, is in fact a negative energy. And then typically we say, uh, uh, we write this in, in, in second quantized form here, but th the point is we're, we're, trying to, we're drawing a picture of the electronic structure, and what I'm saying is if I destroy an electron on site M and move it over to site M plus one, that's the energy, okay? Just the attraction of an electron on one side to the nucleus on the next side uh, gives me uh, an energy uh, of this magnitude. And by the way, the, uh, a simple, a simple uh, estimate of that is that this quantity T naught is approximately the ionization potential, 
should do it that way, times the overlap integral, okay? where this is the if you if you just look at these two uh, uh, if you just look at these two orbitals, one is centered here, the other one is centered here, but they overlap the wave functions overlap, of course. If the if the two electrons were on the same side, then it would be the charge density, and that charge density would be attracted to the nucleus, and the binding energy would be the ionization potential. So the transfer integral is approximately the ionization potential times the overlap. So we're thinking about a small motion of, of this carbon atom this way, small motion of this carbon atom this way, uh, we'll call the displacement of this carbon atom um and this one um plus one, and we want to allow these uh, the structure to find its lowest energy state. We're calculating the electronic structure uh, as a function of this, of this position, and then we would, in the end, like to, to minimize the overall structure. Here's the uh, zero of energy, which is the energy of the individual CH unit, the pi electron. It's the pi electron energy. Because of this, uh, of this uh, transfer integral, you get a band structure. The uh, pi band starts at minus 2t0, goes up to here. There's an energy gap, and then goes up to plus 2t0. So, so this is 4t0. That's the overall band width. That's a general statement, by the way. The, in tight binding theory, the band width is 4 times the transfer integral. So this is density of states versus energy. And why is the density of states so high here? It's because the curvature goes to zero here. I, had, I took all the states that were in this continuum when the energy gap was closed. I, took, I, I pushed the states down, and I, and I piled them all up here at the band edge. So the density of states right near the band edge is quite high. In this simple picture, it's in fact divergent. Goes like one over the square root of, of, of the energy. Uh, this is the pi band. In semiconductor physics, we call it the valence band. This is the, the pi star band. And this is the density of states in the pi star band. And in semiconductor physics, we call this the conduction band. Uh, so there's, there's a small language shift here. This is the pi band. This is the pi star band. This is filled. This is empty. It's a one-dimensional tight binding band structure. This picture is, is highly idealized. Uh, two things in particular. Uh, I've left out disorder in this simple picture. We know that these systems are not single crystals. So we know that disorder is, is important. Turns out that if you take a sample of the kind that I passed around and put it in front of an x-ray beam and look at the diffraction, you will see some crystallinity. So they're not, this material is not completely amorphous. Some of the polymers that we deal with are, are basically completely amorphous. Uh, and as a re but as a result of the disorder, okay, this picture is, uh, is uh, idealized. What is the effect of the disorder? Well, from, from the point of view of, uh, of this picture, disorder will, will, will smear out the band states. I mean, the, it'll, it'll give you a distribution uh, of states. Uh, and so these band edges will be broadened. If the disorder were large enough, uh, one could even uh, cause the the energy gap to go away. But at least in some cases, in cases where we do make some effort to, to achieve some structural order, the, uh, the disorder is sufficiently weak that we can use these kinds of pictures as a, as a simple picture to think about. And I'll talk more about disorder uh, in as we, go, as we go along. The important thing here is that, that these bands are broad. Okay? 
And again, I would, I, would, I would make the comparison. If one were dealing with materials like pentacene, small molecular structures, and one had, the kind, one had uh, disordered structures, then immediately all the wave functions become localized. Here, in this case, because these bandwidths are, are, are rather broad, because this is a bandwidth which is like that of silicon or copper, even though they're, they're disordered, one can use this kind of a picture as a zeroth order uh, starting place for your thinking. Uh, the other point, of course, uh, I emphasized earlier, the other, the other feature that's left out of here, not included, is the electron-electron interactions, which in the limit of, if, if those interactions were very large, would, uh, uh, would make this picture completely invalid, and you'd have to go back to a localized picture with spin up, spin down, spin up, spin down, antiferromagnetism. Now again, the, 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 the characteristic uh, energies here are the bandwidth. Think of it this way. Within this picture, you go from, with a single carbon atom, from this energy to occupying all of these states. Okay? So therefore, the average energy is about here. Okay? So you lower the energy of the system by roughly half of this bandwidth, or approximately this quantity T0. If, on the other hand, you localized all the electrons, formed a magnetic insulator, spin up, spin down, spin up, spin down, then the, the electronic energy would be here, and you would therefore not get this delocalization energy. So the comparison has to do with the strength of the bandwidth, T, versus the electron-electron interaction. So it comes back to that again. <coughs> Polyacetylene is a semiconductor and a metal, as, as we will see, because the bandwidth is large compared to the electron-electron interaction. Utilizing electron energy loss for measuring, determining the electronic structure. And the idea is you, you take a, an electron beam, uh, you pass that electron beam through a thin film of the material that you are interested in, and you measure two things. You measure the energy loss, so you know the in input energy and you, and, you, you, and you can measure the output energy, so that gives you the energy loss, delta E, and you also measure the uh, the angle, so now you've got the energy loss, and because, and because, energy, because momentum is conserved, uh, by measuring this angle, you get, you, get, you get information about the dispersion curve, E versus K. And here are the data that came from this paper by Fink and Lysing. In, uh, <clears throat> in 1986. And what you see here basically is that they determined that this band width was over 12 electron volts. Remarkable. They determined that this band gap, this is a, the one dimensional band gap, was about 1.80 V. This is the lowest energy excitation. That's at the band, at the uh, zone boundary and at the, at the band gap. But of course, if you go from here to here, or here to here, or here to here, all of these transitions are allowed in the electron, uh, are detected in the electron energy loss experiments. So then you can uh, plot out this entire excitation spectrum. Two things, we get, in fact, the numbers Okay. The numbers are about what we you know, estimated. There are no surprises. We also find that it works. I mean, the picture, this very simple picture, is basically correct. There's no, no sign of anything really anomalous. These, these curves are exactly what you would have expected if you took the electronic structure that I drew and took it literally seriously. 
even though we know that it's an oversimplified picture, that we have, uh, we have not uh, included uh, the electron-electron interactions in a straightforward way, must be okay, must be possible to treat them in perturbation theory would be the argument. But great deal of confidence that these data provide you perhaps the most direct information, experimental information, on the electronic structure. And it's remarkably simple. And this picture of a pi and a pi star band and associated density of states is, is basically correct. If you have one atom in the repeat unit, as we had in polyacetylene, then you get an electronic structure like this. <coughs> that is the pi band, the overall pi band is split into two bands, the pi and the pi star, because I doubled the unit cell. Okay? I doubled the unit cell. If, 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 the, if there were no distortion, this, this pi electron structure would go all the way out to here, to pi over A, there would be no energy gap. By doubling the unit cell, I fold it back, put in an energy gap, create a pi and a pi star band. More generally, of course, if you have four atoms in the repeat unit, six atoms in the repeat unit, eight atoms in the repeat unit, then you get more subbands and more additional band gaps. And I'm, I'm, I'm emphasizing that here with the electronic structure of polyparaphenylene, vinylene, PPV. So here's PPV. PPV is basically a alternate, an, an alternating copolymer between polyacetylene here and uh, polyparaphenylene. You can think of it that way, literally, as, a, as a, an alternating copolymer. But now you see I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight electrons in the repeat unit. This is the this is the repeat unit. Okay. So since I have eight electrons in the repeat unit, I have to have eight bands. So I ha and here, here they are. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And there's a, there are a lot of interesting features to that, to that band structure. Uh, but look, let, let's just start from the beginning and, and look at some numbers. First of all, this is in electron volts, and you notice that the overall bandwidth is the same as it was in polyacetylene. And there's very good reason for that, because the pi-pi overlap, the pi electron transfer integral, is again about two and a half, three electron volts. Three times four is 12, and that's, that's why this band structure goes over 12 EV. Now some of these bands are quite you can sort of see a metallic-like, right? There's a band gap there, but you can think of that as one band where there's a band gap here. Here's another one, right? So there's a fairly large dispersion and a band gap. Some of the bands are quite flat. It turns out, if you look at the, at the quantum chemistry of that, the flat bands come about because in the uh, wave functions of benzene, you just take benzene alone, okay, and you calculate the molecular orbitals. You remember how this goes. There's a there's there's a, a lowest energy one, two degenerate ones here, two degenerate ones here, and then a high energy one. Six six uh, six molecular orbitals because there are six atoms in benzene. Two of the intermediate energy wave functions have a node at this point. If there's a node at this point, then there's no way that the electronic wave, fu uh, wave function can delocalize out of, out of past that node, okay? And therefore, this band is truly flat, and this one is truly flat, okay? Not, it's flat because of a, of a symmetry reasons, because there's a node in the wave function of, uh, of benzene. Uh, these, these are, uh, these two bands here are flat, nearly flat, but not completely flat. And of course, every one of these bands can hold two electrons, spin up and spin down. So there are two electrons here, four, six, eight. So all eight electrons are accommodated in these four bands. 
So these are the pi bands, now, several, now four of them. These are the pi star bands. This is the lowest energy gap that determines the optical, lowest energy optical absorption and, the, and, the, uh, and as you know, the photoluminescence, et cetera. This is an incomplete list, but, but let's just look at it for a moment. Um, here's polyacetylene, bond alternated structure. All of these conjugated polymers are semiconductors. All of them have these bond alternated structures. In this case, the bond alternation is like a cis polyacetylene structure, but it's held together and stabilized by the heteroatom, the sulfur atom. This is polythiophene. This is uh, polypyrrole. Instead of the sulfur, you put in the nitrogen. This is polyparaphenylene. And then we can start to play. So we can take polyparaphenylene and polyacetylene and make an alternating copolymer. That's PPV. We can take, it's not shown here, we can take polythiophene and polyacetylene and make a polythienylene vinylene. It's basically this structure, but this is a, this is a thiophene unit. Beautiful polymer. Very small band gap. As you know, polyacetylene is, un, is uh, intractable. It doesn't dissolve in anything. It, it, the interactions are, uh, between the chains are sufficiently large that you can't melt it. By the time you get up, raise the temperature to a temperature where it might melt, it's no longer stable. So why is that? Okay. The reason for that basically is back here. Well, let's go here. It doesn't matter. These are, these are broadband systems. There's a lot of polarizability here. Okay? If, you, uh, uh, if you calculate the, the dielectric constant, there's a lot of oscillator strength from this transition. Compare this with a polyethylene, for example, where all of this is, is gone. You just have sigma, sigma star. The dielectric constant is much smaller. The polarizability is much smaller. Now, why does that matter? Well, if you look back uh, at the theory of the van der Waals uh, interactions, come about from, from uh, quantum fluctuations of the polarizability. In these pi electron systems, in these semiconducting polymers, polarizability is sufficiently large that, that the van der Waals interaction is so large that, in fact, they won't melt. Okay? How can we deal with that? Well, we can deal with that, for example, by, if the chemistry is compatible, by putting a side chain on here. What you have, then, is, uh, first of all, you tend to, obviously, decrease the, the van der Waals forces because some sense you're moving the chains farther apart. Also, these flexible side chains introduce significant entropy into the, uh, into the uh, because of the different conformations of the side chains, and they tend to make such a, such a, a polymer soluble in a common organic solvent that likes these side chains. And this is the the famous MEH-PPV where you have the ethyl hexyl on one side and, and the methoxy on the other side, uh, this becomes a soluble, processable polymer. There was, in the, in the early days, there was a, a fear of doing this because we all understood that if you wanted to have electrical transport, along a piece of real material, that electrons had to hop from chain to chain because there was no single macromolecule which would uh, span the entire system. So we were, we were worried about things like this because they would separate the chains. Now, as it turns out, 
You should never let worries like that stop you from doing science. Turns out what happens is the, the thiophene units stack, the side chains are out here, okay? and basically you get something you hadn't expected, but it's like a two-dimensional system. So you can have both good interchain order, sufficiently good to, to get very, very good transport, and you can have materials that melt because these things can start moving around and, and are soluble. These are soluble versions of polyparaphenylene. This is the, uh, this is the polyfluorine structure here with some, some uh, co more complex side chains. This is a, uh, a stable polyacetylene. So here's the polyacetylene backbone stabilized by, by this uh, heptadiene structure. So over the years, a whole class of polymers, and it's still going on. This is uh, P dot. Okay? This is quite simply the polythiophene in which one has put on this uh, additional structure. We'll talk more about polyaniline. Uh, a very nice uh, structure. This is a, uh, a semiconductor as well. And you can think of this also as, a, uh, uh, as an alternating copolymer. Uh, it's a copolymer of, yeah, of these two units and these two units. Okay. This is the emeraldine base. We'll talk about doping it. In a straightforward way, of course not trivial, uh, can go through the electronic structure of all of these systems and start thinking about what the band structure looks like 